Okay, well, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Chris Muller. I'm a senior lecturer in cultural studies and media up at Macquarie, and I'm one of the conveners of the final panel of the day. Um, so we might not take the full 90 minutes, so just so you know, so it'll be a bit of space. Um, I want to start with a really big thank you to Yuji and to everyone who's been organizing and presenting at the symposium today. I mean, I know Yuji, especially you've been working tirelessly, um, so, and we're, yeah. we're all here, and also you at, at Sydney, so thanks so much for all that work. Um, yeah, maybe a quick uh, hand of applause. Thank you. Now, um, this panel intersects with the Australasian Humor Studies Network Conference, Humor as a Human Right, which is taking place all week here, um, hosted by the University of Sydney. And I'd like to introduce my panel co-convener, Benjamin Nickel, who's a lecturer in Comparative Literature and Translation Studies here at Sydney, um, who's one of the uh, main organizers of the Humor Studies Conference. So, so this is kind of how this panel came together. Um, now, this panel is about the datafication and digitalization of humor, a subject that both Ben and I kind of have been researching for a while. And um, we'll have some time to consider how laughter acts as an interface to technology, how it shapes, how we interact, how we encounter it, how we might feel when we interact with technology. And I think we all laughed earlier when we saw those robot clips. So that's a good illustration of how immediate, how powerful this response is and how, how it shapes our uh, orientation. Now there's a really long history and tradition of trying to design machines that can somehow make us laugh rather than run away screaming or feel like incompetent, that kind of thing. And, and these are the kind of points that hopefully we, we can return to in the discussion so we can broaden it up a bit um, onto this general question. Um, but if you've been reading the news, uh, especially last year, you might have come across the story that actually led to this panel. So last October, September, there was head, headlines such as robots are learning to laugh at the right time and so forth. And this is um, all inspired by a research team uh, that we can feature here today. So we're really delighted that we can introduce Divesh uh, Lala, uh, who is part of the research team that inspired that story. They um, developed a robot that laughs, uh, laughs autonomously, so I won't try to sum it up. Um, Divesh is currently a researcher at Kyoto University working on conversational robots. He contributes to the Japanese government-funded Moonshot project, which aims to create a human robot symbiotic society. Um, his research interests are based on integrating non-linguistic conversational phenomena into robots, uh, such as back channels, turn takings, and of course, laughter. And I think with that, um, and yes. Yeah. So, sorry, I was just going to say again, thanks Yuji, and thank you so much for teaming up with the HSA. And we're really appreciating of that fact. And um, yeah, over to Divesh. Yeah, Divesh, uh, all over to you, so. Okay, thanks. Can, you can hear me well? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so as you can see from my camera, um, this isn't me, this is a robot. Erica, um, and this is kind of the robot that we use for a lot of our research, actually. Um, and as you can see, it's, yeah, it's an Android robot, um, quite realistic compared to, you know, like Pepper and other now and other types of robots. Um, she has a large number of functionalities, I guess. Um, and yeah, she can do uh, a lot of stuff um, in Japanese, so. Oh. So, yeah, unfortunately, um, she only reads um, the text of speech is only in Japanese. Uh, we don't really have English um, text of speech in story at the moment. Uh, but, you know, she has, as you can see, she has lip sync and things like that. We can make her say whatever we want. Um, and it is a really good robot to use um, if you want to study conversational systems um, like I do. So now, okay, I'll put the camera back to me. Um, so now I'm going to present my, our work um, that we've done at Kyoto University. 
Um, and I'll start my presentation. presentation. Yep. Okay. So, um, so the title of my talk is How to Make a Robot Laugh, and it's sort of. Um, so it's really, it's really not, um, I don't know, how do you say, a complete laughter system. Um, it's something that we kind of just thought about um, and tried to make. So our research group isn't made up of anthropologists or sociologists or stuff. Uh, we kind of work with programmers and engineers. Um, so I guess some of the things that I say in this talk might seem like kind of really stupid and like weird to some other people. Um, but we managed to make the system, which um, I think, yeah, is quite good. So, okay, so just a bit of background. Um, I'm a researcher at Kyoto University. Um, I lived in Japan for maybe 10, more than 10 years now, and I've been working with androids like such as Erica for about five years. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work um, in this field, um, and my work is basically in spoken dialogue systems. So it's users or people um, having conversations with robots. Um, and we have many types of robots actually um, that we have in, in our lab. So, you know, I just introduced um, Erica as an Android robot. Um, we also have things like Quamu, which is like this very kind of smallish robot that can you put on your desk and it will talk to you. Um, and then for the Moonshot project, um, we're working with a virtual agent, Gene. So it's basically, they all kind of, uh, the purposes are all the, kind of for the same thing. Um, we want to make a conversational system out of this, a um, spoken dialogue system that people can talk to. Today I'll focus on Erica, uh, because people are kind of always interested in Erica, um, you know, by the mere fact that she's an android. Um, Erica stands for Arado Intelligent Conversational Android. Um, Arado is actually the name of the project um, where she originated from um, more than five years ago now. And many of you know Hiroshi Shigura, um, he's quite yeah, he's quite famous for making androids. Um, he's made an android of himself as well. Uh, so, yeah, he designed this android um, basically to be one of the world's most beautiful robots um, and that can hold a conversation with you. So <clears throat> part of our work is to program Erica's dialogue system. So we don't actually program, like, for example, gestures and, like, the actual movements of the robot. Um, we're only interested in the dialogue system. Um, but of course, we know from conversation that um, like gesture and eye gaze and things like that are very related to dialogue as well. And so what kind of research do we actually do? So <clears throat> our aim is to make robots which can engage in what we call like human-like conversation. Um, and how, how you want to define human-like is very much up in the air. But um, yeah, it's basically this. And so we need several types of conversations that um, we've implemented in Erica. Um, Retentive listening, um, we've done a um, spoken dialogue system that has the robot doing a job interview. Uh, we also did one speed dating, so how would you feel if you're um, speed dating with an Android robot? Uh, but I'm going to talk more about the attentive listening side because uh, we put a lot of work into that actually. So attentive listening is basically where the human is responsible for a lot of talk. Um, so, in, for example, elderly homes or rest homes, you know, there might be some social isolation. Um, so we feel that all of, you know, these socially isolated people um, can kind of talk with a robot. Um, maybe it will help them, you know, mental, uh, mentally, cognitively, things like that. Um, so we think it'll be quite useful um, in this situation. So we are, we're actually doing, um, we're running studies in rest homes at the moment and um, other hospitals um, with this type of system. So here's an example um, of attentive listening, actually. So you can kind of see what kind of um, things um, I talked about. America, New York, Okay, so that's just a small example. Um, and in this in this scenario, um, Erica was actually fully autonomous, so there's no um, teleoperational things like that. 
Um, so we try and figure out, for example, what the user was talking about, and then Erica can respond with some very small sentences to kind of stimulate conversation. So actually, this can go on for as long as you want. Um, like you can talk to Erica forever, actually, and she'll reply with, with something. But then um, <clears throat> it isn't just about conversation. So why did we choose to actually put laughter in this? Um, well, basically, we know that laughter is something that routinely happens in conversation. So, you know, when we're chatting and talking to friends, yeah, it, it happens. And so by not having it, it feels kind of unnatural, I think. But we observe that most conversational robots don't actually have a laughing functionality. So it's actually quite hard to do, I think. Um, and a lot of conversational robots are just for task-based task, task -based things as well. So, for example, um, if you've seen Pepper, maybe, you know, at the some shop or something like that, you can ask Pepper questions. But you don't really expect Pepper to laugh um, at your question, or you, you don't expect Pepper to do anything when you tell a joke to it. Um, and it, it, it's the same with Erica, actually. So Erica wouldn't react to um, any funny or humorous dialogue the user said. So if somebody said something, you know, they thought was a joke or, you know, tried to make kind of laugh, conversation of laughing at it, Erica would just kind of sit there and you know, not really do anything. So it's actually really unnatural that nothing happens here. Um, and I'll show you a clip um, with the autonomous Erica um, and then the user, in, in this thing, you, you, you hear the user laugh, but Erica doesn't really react well, that's what. So we feel that this is kind of indicative of what would happen. So the user would laugh um, that expects some response from Erica, but she wouldn't be able to respond with anything like reasonable. And then she just says, mm-hmm. Um, so it's very, you know, unnatural and kind of maybe uncomfortable for the user. Okay. So after we kind of observed this, um, we had this motivation. So we wanted to design a method for a robot to laugh during a conversation. So how do we get Erica to actually laugh and laugh at the right time? So there's a few technical requirements, actually. Um, first, obviously, we have to detect when a robot can laugh. So it can't just laugh any time, obviously. We have to know when it can laugh. Um, next, we have to decide if it can laugh. So even if we know that it can laugh, should the robot laugh? So this is another important question. And also how the robot should laugh as well. So this means what type of laugh should the robot use? I mean, obviously you can't just use the same laugh over and over. This will sound unnatural as well. So we have to find a way that we can um, decide what the best type of laughter is. Okay. So first, um, I'll go through these. So first I'm gonna detect when a robot can laugh. Um, and how can we decide this? Well, <laughs> very easy for us actually. So for humans, we can laugh when someone says something funny or humorous. Okay. And this is very kind of very easy for us to do. Or, well, okay. Yeah. In most cases, it's very easy for us to do, knowing when something is funny or humorous, um, especially around friends or something. How does a robot know if something is funny? And actually, this is, this is actually very difficult, um, especially for sarcasm and irony and things like that, or deadpan jokes. It's very really hard, right? Very really hard to teach that. Um, laughter model to a robot. So, for example, if the user says, Oh, maybe you're too full from dinner last night. So, this is something that's attempted to set up a joke, maybe. Um, and Erica might laugh, but in, in most cases, she won't, because how, how would you know, like, to, um, to do anything here? The robot has to know, actually, um, firstly, uh, what dinner is, um, what it means to be too full. And the actual essence of a joke is, 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 is that a robot can't really be full from dinner because a robot can't eat. So how do you get some system that parses all that information and then recognize it as a joke? And so there could be language models that do it if we have a lot of, lots and lots of data, but at that time, we don't have that much data to work with. Um, and it's really hard. It's very hard to do. So we kind of scrapped this idea. So we, we don't use actually any language processing from the user. But another thing we, we thought of, and this is really stupid and easy and maybe naive, but 
We just thought, okay, what does somebody else laugh? What does the user laugh? And all we had to do then is detect when the user laughs, and then we have a natural signal that maybe the robot can laugh as well. So for example, if the user now says the same thing, but at the end they laugh a little bit, then Erica can maybe detect this laughter and say, okay, this is a good time to laugh. So I'm going to respond to the laugh. And so in this way, we use the natural signal of a user um, to generate some kind of laughter. And this is a very, very, I guess, naive way of doing it. But um, when we looked at, you know, when we looked at the data, we thought, oh, okay, maybe we can use this as a pattern. At least in the very um, worst case, at least we don't leave long silences where the user kind of laughs and it's just silent for a while, which is very uncomfortable. So we actually call this shared laughter. So when the user laughs, and Erica laughs in response. So the system can detect laughter from the human, then the robot can start to laugh with them. Okay. Um, and at the very least, we can, as I said, reduce these uncomfortable silences when the user laughs by themselves. So all we have to do then, okay, to make the system is detect laughter in the human speech. If we can detect this laughter, then we know um, when Erica can laugh. Uh, but first, we've got to collect the data, okay? And so what we did, um, we actually had human-robots interaction data. Um, and Erica was controlled by a hidden operator. So if you can see on the slide here, um, Erica's on the right, and then we have a hidden operator in a room, which actually controls Erica um, and can speak for her. Um, and and we're hidden away, and they have a conversation with the subject. Um, and then so what we did, we had some... Scenario, scenarios or attentive listening scenarios, uh, speed dating scenarios. Um, and we annotated all these conversations. So we have about eight, I think 80 or 90 conversations. Um, and we find these samples to train a laughter detection model. So basically, we're all we're doing is try to um, extract samples of laughter. And if we can extract samples of laughter, we can detect, uh, we can kind of classify it into laughter or just normal speech. Okay, so here's an example of maybe some shared laughter. One of the sessions. Okay. So, in the example, you see, you know, the user laughed a little bit, and then Erica or the operator um, laughed in response. So, this is an example of kind of the shared laughter we were looking for. So, you want to recreate something like this. Okay, so what we did, um, we got all the utterances, so there's about 30,000 of them, and we found that maybe about 2,500 of these were actually to do with the subject laughing, um, or laughs at the end of speech that we can use for the data. And so all we basically did was extract these audio features and then trained the model to detect this type of laughter. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the details of um, the deep learning model and all this stuff. It's just, yeah, I'll keep it quite, quite light, but just know we trained a model to do this. Okay, so this is our first step. So we've detected laughter, okay? So if the user laughs, we can detect laughter, okay? Let's, let's assume the performance is pretty good as well. All right, so the next step is actually to decide if the robot should laugh, okay? And this is actually really important. Um, we don't, we didn't really see any research um, in this, well, in the engineering or computer science research, um, if this kind of question has been addressed. Um, and basically, it comes out of this question. For example, okay, so if, for example, we know when a robot can laugh, so if, if we're here, we can detect laughter, then we have a model already, actually. We have a, we have a model which says, if we detect laughter, then Erica can respond with laughter. But should a robot laugh every time the user laughs? No. And the reason is, and according to what we found in our corpus, is that most laughing isn't shared. So, we have 1,657 initial laughs. Only, well, less than 20% of those are actually shared laughs, which means that most of the laughs aren't shared. There's solo laughs where the user or the subject just kind of, you know, laughs, laughs to themselves um, or doesn't expect some kind of laughter in response. So this is actually quite important to know. So we have, we have to make a model which can actually pick up when, or oh, sorry, if the user should laugh at a certain time. 
okay? So unsheared laughs. Most laughs are unsheared, so we know this from our corpus, and the user doesn't expect the laugh as a response. And if we think this is because we often laugh for reasons other than something being funny. So, you know, I can actually laugh. I can say, ah, the weather today was, yeah, pretty cold <laughs> and something like that. But I don't expect the other person to laugh with me. It's not really a joke. Um, it's not really something humorous. It's just some, maybe some time filler or, um, you know, something to buy me time while I'm thinking of something to say. So we found a lot of these in the data. So for, I'll, I'll play you an example of, of this kind of thing. So in that case, the user actually laughs, but he laughs because he's saying his coach was strict. So this isn't something that maybe is not that funny or like something that is a joke. So the operator, um, or it, it, yeah, the operator um, who controlled Erica didn't actually respond with laughter in this in this situation, just said asking like air, eh, which is like, ah, oh, well. So, you know, we find a lot of these kind of situations with um, laughter. So we have to be able to differentiate between laughs which can be responded to and laughs which don't need to be responded to. Okay. So we classified all those laughs into unshared and shared laughs. Okay. So basically laughs not shared and shared. And then we trained another model, which given the initial laugh, so we, had, we already had these initial laugh features, and we predict that if that laugh should be answered with response laugh. In other words, we predict whether it, there should be shared laughter. Okay, so this is the second step. So firstly, we detect whether there is laughter. Next, we predict whether this laughter that the user has done should be responded to with shared laughter. Okay. So this is the second step of our model. Now, thirdly, or the, the last thing we do is decide how the robot should laugh. And this might seem pretty unimportant, actually. So, you know, we know laughter happened, we know that the user has laughed, and we predicted, okay, Erica should laugh. So why don't why doesn't Erica just laugh now? But actually, um, there's different types of laughter. So deciding how a robot should laugh is actually quite important as well. So we looked at the lips on literature, um, and you know, there's a lot of different types of laughter. Okay, so there's like sarcastic laughter, ironic laughter, um, you know, very joyful laughter, uh, very kind of wry laughter. But, you know, it's very hard to kind of make a model which can differentiate between that. So we focus on this very simple model a mirthful laugh or a social laugh. And unlike, and this is a good thing about Eric actually, unlike most robots, Eric can actually do both of these laughs. So if you're designing a robot and you need it to laugh, you can't just have a robot do the same laugh over and over, I think. This is very kind of unnatural. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't um, help in these different situations where you have to do different types of laughter. So, <clears throat> for example, with the last, um, we found uh, laughter to be elicited by positive moods and expressed towards the dialogue itself. So you, you can think of with the last as like laughing at a joke or laughing um, because something is funny. It's very kind of joyful um, in a way. So for example, I'll play a couple of examples from, from Erica's um, laughter. <laughs> okay. And there's another one. <laughs> so you can maybe imagine that kind of laughter, if, you know, you're told a very funny joke or something is interesting on the other hand um we have social laughs so social laughs kind of augment and like fill the conversation humor is not necessarily involved in this in this kind of situation so in this case the laughter sounds a little a little more um how do you say downplayed like this oh, okay <laughs> okay so it's very subtle <laughs> okay so we kind of differentiated these two types of laughter. We wanted to um, ensure that these are set at the right times, actually. So, <clears throat> for example, if the, if the user um, says something very, uh, you know, if, if their laughter is very social-like, like very subtle, you don't usually reply with a very ha 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 ha, very loud laugh, Marika. You should reply with a very um, another social laugh. So this is quite important. We, we should be able to pick this up from how the user laughs, what kind of laugh should be used in response. 
okay? So what we did, um, for all the unshared laughs, we hired these five annotators to classify um, response laughs in a social, into a social type or a mutual type, okay? Um, and actually, th this isn't actually easy either, okay? So the subject of differences, are, uh, uh, the differences between annotators is quite large, actually. Uh, we don't get a huge, like, a very good score for agreement, actually, over this. Um, so we had to take kind of some majority agreement to kind of, um, you know, be able to make a model or label, label our model. And you can see that social laughs are more common than local laughs, okay? So more than two to one uh, social to local laughs. Uh, so this means actually that if you're making a robot with laughter, you should actually use more response laughs or you should ensure that your robot can do, um, sorry, so social laughs uh, because these are the most common type. So now what we can do is use the initial laugh, okay? So remember, we know the initial laugh of the user. We've already got that information. And then we predict the response laugh type. So given, given how the user laughs, we want to predict the type of laugh that um, the robot should make, okay? So this is it. So we have um, the user laugh. So maybe you're too full laugh out of dinner. <laughs> System tries to detect that laughter, predicts whether that's shared laughter, so predicts whether we should um, use the robot as a response uh, to laughter in, in response, and then choose the laughter type. So, for example, should it be mirthful or should it be social? Okay. And then that's it. That's our three steps. Um, and then Erica can suddenly respond with a laugh to this. Okay. So it's a very easy. I would say at this at this point, it's a very naive model because all we're doing is using the audio signal of the user. Um, and I'm going to tell you some limitations of this model, and they're very big limitations. Okay, but first, we did a subjective evaluation actually. And then what we did was we compared our full laughter system with a system that doesn't laugh and one on the other extreme, which always responds with a shared laugh when it detects a laugh. Okay, so we have two kind of extremes here. So the users listen to audio dialogues. So they listen to some um, you know, dialogues um, that we created um, under these three conditions. And then they rated it a naturalness, empathy, understanding, human likeness. Um, and what we found is that our system um, is dependent on the dialogues, actually. In some cases, the baseline is actually better, um, particularly um, when you always laugh, always respond with a shared laugh. And it might be better, actually. Um, so our system could improve the baseline in some dialogues, but in other ones, it failed quite, it failed a lot. Okay, so this is there's very no real set rule that we can say our system generally or always beats the um, baseline system. But what we did find is that laughter in general is important in this kind of system. So even under uh, sorry, out of all the three conditions, the non laughing system never outperformed the other ones. Okay, so it pays to have some system where you can laugh, actually. And in, con in chatting conversation, you should be able to, um, you know, laugh. The robot should have to laugh in some way. Okay. So what do we conclude, actually, from our study? So laughing, laughing is a necessary feature in a chat dialogue system. Um, but predicting if you should laugh is actually just as important, but it's very hard to do, actually. Um, and you'll see in my slides to come that actually this Predicting if you should laugh is actually kind of the weakest of the three uh, kind of classifier models we had. But social laughs are necessary. Um, yeah, this is an important thing. So as I said, if your robot doesn't do social laugh, it's going to sound strange, I think, because it will laugh very joyfully at kind of anything, um, which is maybe not so good. Another thing that is very, that is very um, this is something that's very, uh, how do you say, very important for me. The performance of our model in the lab or in the experiment, it does not equal the real world performance actually. And it's and you there's no way you can predict how good it would be in the real world. Small errors, so there's always errors in models, and especially not in what we do, there's always errors. And small errors can have very influential outcomes um, on the overall dialogue system. Um, so we need to see read a paper about you know conversational robots and you know um we put all these features into the model and we got like 90% accuracy or 80% accuracy. But it's only in a lab environment, then you 
cannot really trust that that's going to happen in the real world. And I've seen it over and over again with many different types of models, back channels, turn taking that we've, we've made as well. And these small errors actually can influence the model quite a lot. Okay, so this is, this is something that's really, I, I can't stress how important this is to conclude. That, that what we do in the lab does not necessarily affect what will happen in the real world. We try to make it like the real world, but it, it's, there's always something that, um, you know, makes it very, uh, like, it, it's not perfect. Okay. So, now let's see the model in action, actually. So, this is a video uh, from my co-author called Yenoi. Um, and you'll see, you'll, you'll see our model in action, actually, the, shared, the total shared alpha model. この前、あの、一度晩で勉強したのに、あの、テストに合格しちゃったんですよ。うんうん。どうですか。はい、そうなんです。とても<笑><笑> <笑>そうなんですね。そうなんですよ。あの、この前試験があって一生懸命勉強したんですけど、あの、0点を取っちゃってとても悲しかったです。うん。残念でしたね。はい、そうなんです。Okay, <笑> so it's just an example of a kind of three situations um uh, that our model got, in this case, successfully predict properly. Okay. But now I'm going to get to the problems of this model. And there's a lot of them, actually. Um, and I'm going to, I'll, I'll show you the main ones. And you, you probably picked up some of these up. Here's the first one. Um, and it annoys me as someone who programs these. You have to wait until the raptor stops, actually. So if you notice in the video, there's no overlapping raptor. And the reason is that. Um, the user has to say everything before we can do this detection and prediction and choosing the laptop. But, you know, in the real world, this never happens, well, I am saying never happens, but um, it's not um, that common, actually. So we laugh, we laugh with my friends. I laugh with them in, in, the fact, in the sense that I laugh while they laugh. But in this model, well, this doesn't actually happen. We have to wait until the user completely stops talking and we have to, you know, just a pause and then and then laugh like that. Um, there's probably ways we can do incremental speech recognition where you can laugh, where you can quickly um, classify, but it's still a very big bottleneck to the system actually. Um, so this is this, this, this one thing that makes it a natural. Here's the second one. So <clears throat> this prediction of the shared laughter is actually pretty inaccurate. So if you read our paper, um, it's better than baseline. So I think the baseline was something like 16% F score and ours was like 30. So it's better than baseline, but it's still pretty inaccurate. So you're gonna find lots of different, um, yeah, you, you're gonna find it laughing when you're not supposed to laugh or like not laughing when you're supposed to laugh, things like that. Um, it's, a, it, it, it's quite inaccurate and it, make, it makes a big difference. So actually we still have to kind of tune the model in the sense that according to the user, um, you might have different kind of, uh, how do you say, different results. So we have to kind of tune it for every user, which is not good. Like you want a general thing, which works for everyone. But you know, th this is another problem. It's quite inaccurate still. Third thing, and it's probably most obvious, it doesn't actually matter what you say. You can just laugh and the robot could laugh actually. You can say something stupid or like something that's not funny at all and laugh and the robot could laugh. It doesn't actually matter what you say. All the system does is the picture of laughter and think and tries to work out if it should laugh in response. Whatever you say has no bearing on, um, you know, um, what whether that error should laugh or not. And that's very important, actually. And this is this, this issue is one of the big problems I had actually with this paper, um, even when I, we were writing it. So we have a role that laughs with you, but only after you laugh first, okay, with that kind of okay accuracy, but it still has no idea what you're talking about. 
So this really was not when you break it down like that, it's still not really a human level. We 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 can't claim that oh this robot is like okay, you know this robot can laugh at your jokes, it can you know have fun with you, uh, understands what you're saying. We can't claim that at all from the paper, and we don't claim that in the paper at all actually. Um, this is just a kind of first step for us um, into we're just proposing that you know there's a way that um, a robot can respond with laughter. Our model isn't actually this um, this kind of brilliant, actually. But, and this is a problem. After we published this paper, the media picked up in it. And then we started getting these type of headlines. I just teach a robot room to have a sense of humor. Robot is taught to laugh at jokes. I just teach robot to laugh at jokes. Can a robot get your jokes? Scientists give you an android a sense of humor. We did none of these things. This is actually, these are all headlines, but we did none of this. Um, there's no, nothing to do with jokes. There's nothing about actually humor, actually, because it just all of us take laughter. But people like this idea that a robot, I guess, I guess people like the idea that a robot can laugh at jokes. So you have all these kind of headlines which completely oversell what we did. And, and one of them, I, I think it's, Good, like I'm quite pleased with what, um, the result that we had in our paper. I don't really want to oversell, you know, what we did. Like this is not, unfortunately, for maybe if, if you're expecting me to talk about um, how a robot can like laugh at whatever jokes you say. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Like not with this robot at the moment. So can we ever get robots to laugh properly? Actually, so this is another thing. Like we know that there's limitations. But do we ever get, can we ever get robots laugh properly? So first thing is we need to know language. Okay. So our body doesn't know anything about language. Um, recently, if you've been paying attention a bit, we, we have chat GPT and we know this is a very powerful language model, actually. So you can do a lot with chat GPT. So can we get things at that stage where robots can actually understand like this is a joke? Okay, so but we need to know language for that to happen. We need actually anthropologists, sociologists to work with us. So we're a kind of engineering lab, a computer science lab. So we don't have expertise in like why people laugh or like what makes like, what makes humor or things like that. We kind of just look at things in the in our corpus and think, oh, okay, there's a pattern that maybe we can reproduce, so it looks like a human. Well, that's so the robot looks like a human, but actually, we don't have the expertise in like how the underlying ways that, like, why something is funny or um, how this joke sets up this punchline or something like that. Um, yeah, we, we, we don't do that. Um, so this needs to be, I, for me, this needs to be kind of an interdisciplinary thing. We need robots to know about the real world as much as we do. Okay, so th this is something that is kind of interesting as well. So I think. You probably um, are familiar with the concept of common ground. So people have common ground when they talk. Now think about what the robot needs for common ground when talking with a, with a human, and especially when understanding a joke. It needs to know um, a lot of things. It needs to know like, you know, politics, the culture of the country, what is funny, what isn't funny. Um, yeah, like a lot of things that are contextual, that robots should know if you're gonna be able to laugh at a joke properly. But, you know, this is kind of impossible at this stage, and it's, it's very hard to do. So this is something that um, maybe, if we get, get a robot to laugh properly, this is what we need to do. But it's very, we're very far off from this at this stage. So what else? So this is something that I kind of open up, open up for discussion. Like, what else do we need to get robots to laugh properly? Um, this is something that we've come up with, but, you know, other people have different perspectives. Like, what do you think is bad about, or what do you think you know, seems real stupid about our laughter model? What things can be improved? Um, what do you like about it? We, we can we can kind of discuss those. Okay, and lastly, um, I want to kind of get a bit broader and think about what would a robot laugh about actually. So this is quite important. What would what would a robot laugh about? So we train models where humans laugh at things that humans say. If you are a robot living in society, and, and this is what we're gearing towards in like the Moonshot project, like if robots were Kind of in a society with humans, what would a robot laugh about? So, for example, what, what would this robot laugh about? What, what would Erica laugh about? Like, look at Erica, she's uh, kind of 
mid twenties, um, kind of attractive woman, like the form. I'm talking about the form. Um, so does she laugh at dirty coke? Um, does she laugh at like um, very, I don't know, chauvinistic things? Maybe not. Like, do you do you want her to do that? Like, what would this robot like? It's a little issue girl robot. Okay, Jim and did he made. So do you think this robot should laugh about different things in America? Um, probably, yeah. Like, if you, like, I, I know Ishiguro, he laughs about stuff that I don't laugh about. He has his own sense of humor. Um, so this is something that, you know, um, we can think about. Like, should this robot actually laugh at things that, you know, um, teenage girls laugh about? Probably not. It, it would seem kind of weird, right? What about a child robot? So this is Ibuki, there's another robot um, that you should have created. So what would a child robot laugh about? Would a child robot, should a robot that's a child laugh at adult jokes? Would it seem weird that it, that happened? And maybe what would this robot laugh about? So this robot, you know, is not an Android, um, but it's just a small robot that sits in a desk. So maybe it's your personal robot. If it's your personal robot, should this robot laugh about things that you personally find funny as well? Or should it have its own its own um, ind individual sense of humor? Okay, so these are questions that I think well, maybe we can think about um, that we're interested in the panel. So robots participating in society. Um, I think humor differs according to culture, age, and gender. Um, this is quite for me. This is quite obvious. So, but if humanoid robots participate in human in human society, um, should they learn their own style of humor? Okay. So do we have robot jokes that only robots understand or something like that? Um, and as I've kind of just alluded to, should humor be based on the appearance of the robot? So, you know, you make a robot have some certain uh, affordances. So like, you know, if my robot has a mouth and eyes and like a face, I assume that it can do things like maybe talk and like maybe see me or something like that. And it's the same with humor. Um, the, the, um, say the appearance of a robot um, maybe has some influence on what type of humor um, the robot should react to. Oops. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. So I hope it wasn't too long. Um, but I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to kind of um, hand it over to the panel. Um, I'll be part of that panel as well. Um, and we can discuss some of these things. So thanks. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I, I hope you heard the applause and thanks so much for a really stimulating presentation. I think lots of the questions you raised made me think I always I had to learn all those things as well. <laughs> when to laugh, when not, <laughs> and what kind of laugh and when it's appropriate. So really, really interesting. Um, we might just start by asking like the audience in the room, if there's questions you'd like to put, um, yeah, Tuliva, should we have a question back here? Um, yep. You should hear it, there's a mic going around. Right. Hello, this is kind of strange because you can't see my face, but I can see <laughs> Yeah, yours. that's fine, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me point the camera, it's just a little bit less awkward if people can see me. Hi. Hi, oh, yep, <laughs> okay, my head. yep. Hello. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Lovely. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was super interesting. Yep, um, sorry, but my, my brain went several directions at once. And I think one of the first observations was how everyone reacted differently to the um, gendered performance of that particular robot that um, I'm from Japanese studies. And I've got a lot of colleagues that specialize in women's linguistics and the type of yep. laughing. So my first question is, have you programmed her um, to be able to laugh evilly? Ah, okay, okay. Is she only very, very, a very, very nice <laughs> robot or not? And the reason I ask this yep, is yep. I wonder to what extent it matters that the robot can understand language or not, because for many robot users who quite genuinely use robots as well as um, VTubers or other kinds of avatars, they um, treat the kind of figure as a kind of puppet and it's right, less about yep. the actual mutual connection but more about the imagination as part of that social engagement. Yep. So can she laugh evilly? Can she yeah, reject so, it? Um, so, sorry, just a bit, bit of background. So she has uh, some specialized text-to-speech. 
And that text to speech is actually, so her laugh's actually recorded from a voice actress. So they're not in text to speech in the sense she says, ah ha 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 ha. So she has, I think, 120 something laughs. Um, wow. And, and yeah, and some of them are real stupid. Like some of them are like, there's one that's like a 10 second laugh, which it's just kind of, she just burst out in laughter. Like the actress just burst out in laughter for 10 seconds of laughing. <laughs> And I'm sure there's one of them in there that sounds evil. Like, I haven't gone through all of them, but I'm sure there's a couple of them that <laughs> probably, probably do that. Um, mm. but, we, but, but the problem is that we didn't really tag any of them or, like, we didn't really classify them. So, you know how I showed you uh, Myrtle and Social Arts? We had to go through those, like, like 100 laughs and listen to them and think, oh, is this one a social laugh that's a Myrtle? Like, it's kind of very um, laborious to do. But I'm sure one of them there's probably some evil laugh where she's like, <laughs> or something like that. Delightful. It sounds very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vengeful. I love it. <laughs> Vengeful. Yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Hi, uh, Devesh. Uh, it's Yuji here. Um, hey, thanks for the. Uh, very uh, interesting talk. I just want to ask that, uh, the, uh, as, um, as Japanese uh, speaker, I um, understand that you know the kind of nuances of you know the you know, Erika's laughs, uh, the different types of laughs, and and then one point I felt kind of oh this is uncanny because the very realistic laugh, as opposed to the you know, unrealistic you know the visual you know the you know, the figure. Yeah. So yep. the gap is kind of been a bit turning into you know uncanny body uh, yep. famous concept. So I just did. yeah. Yeah. So actually this is something that I forgot to mention um, that I should mention. So yeah, you'll notice that when, when Erica laughed there, she didn't actually move her shoulder or like her hands or do anything with that. She just kind of says it. And this is yeah, I agree with you. It's very uncanny actually. Um there's a research team from Osaka University who actually dealt with this issue. We're actually dealing with this issue. So um, they match what, what is said to the um, body movements. So um, like if Erica laughs, then the body movements match. So she, it, it looks like she's laughing. It's, it's actually quite good. Um, and it, I think they have a couple of videos out or something. But the only problem with this, it only works, it doesn't work in real time. So we can play, for example, we can play, a, for example, audio file that Erica says, and then she'll do body movements to match the audio. And I think language maybe, but you have to pre-program the language in. But um, yeah, in real time, it's actually quite hard to do to, to um, kind of make it so um, she can do the correct gesture. So Erica actually has some pre-programmed gestures as well, like she can do bowing and things like that. But to make her look like Doing a like a body language or laughing is actually quite tricky to do, actually. Like, and because we only do dialogue, we don't really focus so much on the nonverbal stuff. But I agree, it's something that you know probably should be done because, as you said, it's very um, uh, it doesn't match, right? It doesn't match. So what audio doesn't match the actual body language? So it's very uh, yeah, it makes it un uncanny. Yeah. So I, I agree that this is another issue. Um, but there's other teams working on that. Um, from what I know. And, and maybe this is actually a problem with the Android as well. So if you have an Android variable, you have to make sure that all the body language and things like that are very, um, very realistic. If you do like a pepper or something, if you make pepper laugh, the body language maybe can just be like, ha, 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 and they raise their arms or something like that. Um, and it's very, we, we don't expect it to be, you know, very realistic. But with an Android, you have to make sure that this kind of thing is um, right, yeah, um, quite true of life for us. Yeah, it, it just looks very strange. Yep. I have a question. Yeah. At least some of the Zoom questions. Thank, thank you. My name is Jessica Davis. I'm from here, the University of Sydney. Yeah, how's it going? Part of, I'm, I'm part of the Humor Studies Conference, so I'm coming at the topic from, a, from the point of view of a humor scholar. Very, very interesting presentation and congratulations on a wonderful project. I know there are several teams around the world working on this kind of thing, but looks to me like you've got a very long way and that's great. Mm. I just wanted to ask, 
you would be aware, I take it, in studying types of laughter that there's, in humans at least, not robots perhaps, there's a very big difference between Duchenne laughter, genuine laughter, and yeah. non-Duchenne laughter, yeah. which is carefully codified. When do you think it will be possible for your robot to actually do a proper Duchenne smile or laugh? Because yeah. the number of muscles, <laughs> muscles that are, facial muscles that are involved in Duchenne laughter right. are really amazing. So yeah. how are you doing on that score? Um, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, actually. So, yeah, kind of a Duchenne laughter, like fake laughter, I think, uh, something like that. So I know there's, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's Duchenne smiles as well. Like there's a fake smile you could, that some people could do. And it's maybe... Um, Maybe some people can pick it up. Um, but this depends actually on, as you said, there's, a, there's muscles, there's different muscles that work um, when you do these things. And so to do that, we actually would actually have to create some way that Erica's, like inside Erica's face, there's all these actuators that move. We have to probably add more actuators or like do something to kind of recreate this, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard actually. So. It's not something that we can just be like, oh, we'll just put on a few motors here and a motors there and make it work. Um, we'd have to probably create the robot with the intention, with, with the initial intention that, yeah, this robot can do those Duchenne laughs and like Duchenne smiles and things. Um, I haven't actually tried it. And, and actually a good research question would be, can we try and like, if the user can uh, watch Erica laugh, maybe they think some of these laughs are fake. Um, I don't know, uh, we'd have to try and, do some research on that to see, yeah, if that's if that can be done in the current in our current robot. But yeah, technically it's quite tricky at the moment, actually. I would say. Yeah. Do we have some questions on Zoom, Justine? Uh -huh. Yeah. So the first one is from Joanne, uh, yep. and she says, uh, how about building in a random component so that occasionally the robot does not laugh in a responsive way? This parallels uh, yeah. life you need to yep. from laughter yeah. for some reason. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point, actually. So we didn't actually do the condition for random. And as you said, that, that could be actually quite powerful um, if you think about it like, you sometimes maybe 50% of the time you laugh, 50% not, and maybe it doesn't maybe it doesn't actually matter when you laugh, as long as you laugh, just for laugh the in the sometimes. Um so I, I don't know, yeah. So I don't know the research on if I don't know if there's research on for real humans of if, when they decide to laugh, um, how that's decided, if there's any like research on that. Um, but um yeah, I, I think if, if what you're saying is true, that there's maybe a random component, so it, yeah, it's definitely something that we could look to put in the model. And if that's true, then probably we don't need that initial model, actually. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry the, the middle classifier, because we can just say, okay, 50%, just flip a coin, um, laugh or not laugh, it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, but we, we could try that. Is there another one on Zoom? I haven't. I haven't got a map. Yeah, have we got a? You got? Yeah, we've got another one from YouTube. Um, Hi, you again. Um, yeah. Just one more question. Um, in relation to the uh, the the discussion earlier about the funding, um, so. I do understand that you as an engineer that you know wants to create robots, you know, that can laugh. That's you know probably challenging project and they're probably very interesting. But I just wonder why. Um, I mean, you know, what's the point, you know, that's the robot laugh. Is that you know the it's it's a question of deception. Uh, I mean that's the yeah. you know, the critics of social robotics, you know, talk about, yeah. you know, that uh, the it's it's they are not really laughing. They're not you know they're no emotion you know inside. They just kind yeah. of, you know mimic. So yeah. just curious how you know uh, that the that project you know the you know, frame 
the social, you know, the social importance of this, you know, project where yeah. there's a it is a degree of deception there. So yeah. just kind of funding, you know, your approach. Is, yeah. I mean, now, this, yeah, this is a good point. So yeah, I, I've been asked this question before actually, like why, what, what is even the point of this? Like, we obviously we don't, I don't know, at the current stage, we can't put an Eric, we can't give everyone an Erica and say, okay, you can talk to it. You know, it's just impossible. Um, initially, I guess our um, kind of approach is that, you know, we um, kind of deployed these, deployed some of these, not Erica, but um, these small like commu robots um, inside, you know, like elderly, kind of elderly homes and sort of stuff. Um, we wanted to, like, as you're probably aware, of, Japan has a lot of elderly people, um, and a lot of them are socially isolated. So, our kind of initial, like, a goal for this was maybe, you know, if they could talk with, like, some something, maybe it would improve the social isolation, or, like, they wouldn't feel as lonely. Um, and whether we think that society, like, as a, from a societal point of view, that it's, like, a good thing or a bad thing, um, you know, we have different opinions about that, maybe. Um, but that was our kind of goal for this. And so, by putting laughter in, I think um, we felt that this would improve the actual communication or, you know, the actual aspect of that attentive listening system where, you know, elderly people will actually laugh quite a lot at the robot um, and they like to make jokes and things. Um, I think if you saw the previous video, like where the elderly person was, you know, laughing, but the robot didn't react, um, we feel like this is kind of something where um, by adding this functionality, um, it makes our kind of conversational system better. So I think if our goal, well, sorry, our goal is to make a kind of chatting robot um, that anyone can kind of chat to. Um, so I think this has to be integrated and in, like laughter has to be integrated in it somehow. Um, it's the same with, um, so I study back channels as well. So back channeling is like a very important um, in, like, in conversation. Um, and, you know, I think it's um, because we want to make something that's kind of human-like, um, this actually becomes, uh, let me say, very uh, close to what humans can do. Um, and I think it's the same with laughter. We, we, we should try and make, make things that laugh because, I don't know, it makes it more human, um, I think. If you're making robots for like tasks or something, you probably don't need a laughter engine or you don't need to care about laughter. But for us, because it's chatting and like, it's a social aspect of, um, you know, like social robots, um, I think they really need this kind of thing. Um, and you said there's like deception involved, right? So the, la the robot isn't actually laughing, right? Because they don't understand what you're saying. The same with the no robot says they're sad, like they don't know emotion, they, but they're just saying they're sad. Um, but with that, I, I guess my, my personal opinion is that if you're, um, even if a robot is just pretending to do this kind of stuff, if the user feels that, you know, this is actually kind of, triggering some empathy or triggering some kind of feelings, um, emotions within themselves, then I think maybe there's not such a um, kind of bad idea uh, for it, actually. Maybe this perception is warranted. Um, I, don't, I don't know how other people feel, but um, yeah, that, that, that would be my point of view. Fantastic, thanks. Well, any questions in the room? Well, um, can I ask one question? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah sure. I'm just I'm just interested what the participants made of it. Like what what did they report of the interaction? Was there people who felt laughed at? And I mean, laughter is a very powerful corrective. That's why I thought the, the question about the evil laugh, I also yeah. had that written down, right? Because we use it to kind of communicate, please consider your point of view. You know, please, maybe what you're saying is possibly problematic. It doesn't have to just be this kind of submissive, charming laughter. It can also be a very powerful way of communicating or negotiating cultural values. So did your participants like kind of report about that effect or did they, like, how did they describe the interaction? If you can uh, okay. So I should say that for, for our experiment, we, it wasn't actually interactive. So they listened to audio and we just um, that is, uh, manipulated the audio according to the model. So they, they don't actually see Erica. Uh, they may just listen to, to some audio. But afterwards, you know, we put this into Erica and we like demoed it with like a lot, lot of people. And yeah, I think they felt kind of, I think the first thing that comes 
to their mind is like surprise because they, you know, you don't really expect a robot to laugh back at you, actually. Um, I think that was the first thing. So, like, they laughed. And, it, and actually, because it, our system can pick up, like, very subtle laughs as well, um, when they heard this laughter back from the robot, they're actually quite sh shocked or surprised that it, it could actually happen. Um, because, you know, it, it's quite unexpected. Um, maybe maybe it's a novelty thing at the moment, but, you know, if the ro if robots start becoming very, um, you know, able to do this kind of laughter a lot, then maybe our robot will they'll think, ah, this is kind of, yeah, whatever. This is just a stupid laughter response thing. Um, so yeah, I can only I can only give that information from what I've observed from like demonstrating and stuff. But I'd say it's mostly at first it's surprising that the robot can do this. Um, and yeah, so I don't know, like what would happen if we put in an evil laugh or something like that? It's probably interesting to see what would happen if we ch change the laughter. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, actually. Yeah, this is something that um, yeah people can come and try it out, and uh, we can just have a laugh about it actually. So I think Chris Tisha had a question there. Well, his hands up. Father, can we switch? Ah, to yeah, I see it. I see the camera. Hi, how are you? Hey, how's it going? I'm good. Thanks. Really fascinating work. Um, I guess what uh, what strikes me is the um, phenomenon of the uh, the idea of deception kind of relies on a very um, kind of platonic or platonist um, kind of conception of media more broadly. Um, and if you sort of look at um, the problem of getting a robot to be animated, um, you might look back at the history of animation in the early days um, of creating animation. Um, the animators had to learn various kind of techniques of making believable movement, believable facial expressions. Um, and for example, in the lead up to the early, a lot of the early um, animation was slapstick humor. That was kind of a lot of the first animations. Then Disney came along and added narrative. Um, and there was that sort of puzzle about whether you could actually care for animated um, mm. characters. And there's sort of a similar question now. And I think, you know, when the, the kind of clumsy talk about the uncanny valley um, really is talking about those threshold points where there's a kind of affective sense of the animate um, that is achieved, um, you know, even in the, um, the examples that you're working with. Um, and there's sort of really a million different ways that you might approximate or perform um, animacy in a certain way. Um, so have you thought about sort of treating this, treating a robot kind of theatrically as well as interactionally? Um, yeah, it's a good point, actually. So personally, I haven't done it myself, but I think there's like, when you, when you say theatrically, do you mean like, um, for example, acting or it's some kind of performance or yeah yeah so i mean there's this yeah. sort of there's the real sort of um tendency to think that it has to be autonomous and interactive right right um but if you can get a robot to i mean in fact that's what that's what you said is that when you had a, a recording um that a robot could perform the um you know the the um laughing yeah. gestures um but still that's a success of a sort. Um, yep. So I think um, for, for Erica, actually, she's, I think she's taking to a movie or like it's, um, yeah, it's not interactive, but I think it's similar. So she's doing movies. Um, I think news reporting, something is on TV, something like that. So yeah, there's, I think we're not part of that kind of research area, but I think there's people working on it where, you know, they try and their very best to make it is like animation, like very life life like movements. Um, so you know, she presented as like doing some kind of performance as well. Um, yeah, so this is definitely something that's kind of part of Android research as well. I think it's starting to become quite yeah, popular. So yeah. Yeah, because Disney um, yeah. Disney did animatronics for you know right. the yeah. audio anim animatronics in the uh, in the fifties. Yeah. Um, using kind of recording um audio tracks to trigger yep. animations yeah yeah 
I think we're getting to the stage where, yeah, you, yeah, you know, like um, these kind of animated animatronic stuff is getting quite really quite good. Um, I haven't really, yeah, it is interesting because you know you think like films and stuff have quite good animatronics like this, um, but seeing a live performance of them, um, especially with Erica, um, you can go actually go. She's in some theater or play or something as well, doing something. So, yeah, it's yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, it'll be much harder, I think. But yeah, it's po quite possible that we can do that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your question. Thank you so much. I think if have we got questions in the room or yeah, we've got one last yeah. Um... Yeah, look, I really appreciate that you asked the question, you know, what are the different kinds of laughter that all of these different robots could potentially have and how do we think about that? Um, how yes. do we think about nature or, or the type of laughter that those robots would or should have? Uh, and I guess my question is about what are the risks of reproducing by trying to replicate a real-world scenario, the sort yeah. of gendered, racialized forms yeah. of laughter? Uh, that um, might actually be really concerning if we then put them into a, a real world context where those forms of laughter are being reproduced, and then they may actually. What are the consequences of those yep. then being, um, you know, I guess challenged or or not uh, behaving yeah. in the way that we expect them? And I I, right. I do recall Alexa um, being, t you know, she she did have a creepy laugh. Um, and it, it sort of hit the, hit the media at one stage because people were very concerned about how this laugh uh, drew attention to the surveillance capabilities of Alexa because she would just sort of occasionally come out with this <laughs> when people yeah. walked past. Uh, I'm not even entirely sure how true the story is, but it was a good one because it did. It also drew attention to the fact that as long as she laughs in a, in a feminine and appropriate way, yep. it was completely okay. But as soon as she, you know, went went over the right. line and was performing a different kind of femininity, she was yep. sort of punished by her owners. Yep. Now, yeah, so this is a good question, actually. So there's a lot of opinions on this because, as you can, as you can tell, it was made to be kind of very feminine and beautiful. And this poses some problems, actually. So, like, um, when... So actually, when this our paper hit the media in Japan, there's a bit of kind of backlash from um, like feminists in Japan because the reason the reason is that you know this kind of very feminine laugh um, kind of um, maybe reinforces the stereotypes of what you know Japanese women should kind of like do and like or how they should act and behave. Um, and yeah, I, I actually agree. It's like really you have to be really kind of careful of. Um, how are these kind of things reflected in like like the fiction of society? Like, if, for example, the next produced things, they become like you know Barbie dolls kind of thing. Like, um, you know, you you kind of reinforce these kind of feminine stereotypes, which is maybe is not so good. And you know, um, it it I mean, the, the, this android is like a very expensive. We put a lot of time and effort into this android, um, but you know, this is a Kind of angry that's mid, uh, who's like mid twenties, feminine kind of thing. We don't see androids that are like you know fifty year old like men and like you know the big beer guts or something like that. Um, it's kind of very um, yeah. It, it's kind of getting into the stage where we, I think, we should kind of think about these kind of things. Um, and in the in the sense of laughter, you're right. Like. It, Erica um, Blanche is based on a voice actress, but you know, this voice actress is also a woman who's probably been taught this is the way to laugh in like certain situations, um, theatrically or something like that. Um, yeah, it's just very, um, like, I mean, we haven't, so the thing is, we haven't actually tested our system, like, for example, for example, a male voice, or like, how, like uh, male back channels, male laughter, and stuff like that. And whether people would think, you know, like this is maybe this male voice maybe is a bit more serious or something like that. It's very, um, yeah, this kind of um, the, the kind of appearance of the robot is, is becoming quite 
the paper's been coming quite light like it. Um, I think bodes um, there's are issues that are going to arise for this. And I think we have to kind of catch them now before they become, you know, um, how do you say, very um, dis dispersed into like the media of what robots should and act and sound like um, and how they reinforce kind of other um, human stereotypes as well. Um, so, yeah, it's a good, it's a very complex question, actually. Uh, but, yeah, I, I broadly agree with what you say. Um, like, this kind of thing should be thought about. I'd, yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm impressed with the way of all the rich ways that people interact, that you've chosen laughter as something, this reciprocal laughter as a relatively um, straightforward thing to tackle. And uh, I think that's a very clever choice. And I see that you're focusing on old people, social isolation and the rest. But uh, I'd like to suggest that you might tackle rubber duck problem solving. Are you familiar with that uh, uh, technique? Uh, I've heard of it, but yeah, it's refreshed my memory. Uh, so uh, when people are trying to solve uh, uh, problems, say programming problems, when all else fails, you talk to the rubber duck. And in explaining your problem to the rubber duck, uh, you sometimes get the answer. Yes. It sounds silly, but uh, a lot of people mm. actually do own a rubber duck. And it seemed to me that your tabletop robot uh, might yep. be uh, more effective than a rubber duck by giving certain limited interactions uh, yep. back. So in detecting uh, a confusion in the voice of the speaker, say, are you sure? Or the things of that nature. Uh, yep. So uh, not a big step away from reciprocal laughter, but just detecting uh, verbal tics or uh, voice stresses uh, yep. to actually help people solve business problems. Thanks. Yeah, so, yep. yeah, that's a good point. So we, um, so yeah, part of our research is actually trying to work out um, how, how, like, to, to give you to free example, to pick in confusion. Um, so, you know, we, we have to, like, kind of make models which can detect confusion, actually. Um, and I, I'm not sure how, maybe it's quite difficult to do with a corpus web. The other thing is that we have, you know, um, I mean, not not just laughter. We have like things like back channels and like turn taking and stuff. That I've, um, and all of this requires like a large corpus that you can kind of extract all these examples and then make the model. Um, so yeah, for things like confusion, um, and especially in our kind of corpus, which involves um, like you know attentive listening and like speed dating and stuff. Examples of confusion interaction are quite rare or, or, or rare. Um, and also, we haven't annotated these things either. So, um, you know, annotating, I think you might, you probably are aware, like annotating conversation takes a long time. Um, so, we have to kind of, um, kind of really focus on like what exactly is important for us. Um, so, we've, I think we've done stuff with emotion where like um, we try and detect the emotion of the speaker, like when they're feeling sad or something, then the robot can say, ah. You seem sad or something like that. Um, but it, I think our current models are not really, I don't know, they're, they're not really accurate enough at the moment to kind of be usable in that sense. So I think there's a kind of a technical thing or maybe a, maybe it's a data data thing as well. Like we just don't have the um, right type or amount of data um, that it could work. But yeah, definitely something like, as you said, that can detect, you know, little emotions in the voice or like verbal text or something like that. Yeah, that's, any other stuff is like very helpful for us. Um, so if somebody has a good way of like figuring this out um, that we can use in real time, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, let's thank Divesh for a really wonderful presentation and for and for agreeing to to join us i mean a really massive thanks um it's yeah. been a real pleasure um meeting you and um kind of preparing this i'm sure we'll be in touch yeah, yeah. thanks so much yeah thanks yeah I, it was great yeah thanks thanks Fred, for inviting me actually um yeah i wasn't really expecting to be invited to a humor conference but it, yeah it, it's really interesting to just get some different perspectives on um yeah what kind of stuff we're doing thanks thanks so much cool and um i think we'll hand over to you g um for the remainder of uh, the symposium thanks
You're right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris Penn and Dibash, for the you know, uh, very interesting um, session. And uh, it is great that Ben and um, um, the Chris uh, brought the, you know, uh, the theme of humor to the symposium and um, topics such as you know humor uh, not generally you know picked up in the mainstream debates on on AI and robotics. So. And then, yeah, the band, good luck with the, you know, you know the uh, in-person session of, you know, humor conference from start from tomorrow. <laughs>